Describe the patient's symptoms, Markozovsky. He has a high fever. He would not be in the fever ward otherwise. Stomach pains. Yes. No rash on the chest. You expected one? Well, in a typhoid case. You have told us nothing to suggest it is typhoid yet. Continue. The patient has a stone in his bladder. <coughs> to remove it is one of the few internal operations we can perform with some hope of success. The even lithotomy must be done deftly and as swiftly as possible. In 1846, if one had to find one hospital that represented all that was known about medicine at this time, it would be the great general hospital at Vienna. Built in the 1780s by the Emperor Franz Josef, it was largely a charity institution with 4,000 beds and departments for all known complaints. There were a few private patients, particularly maternity cases, who came in to avoid a scandal. The maternity, or lying-in hospital as it was called, was the largest in Europe. But most patients in these wards were poor, and in return for free treatment were used as teaching material. For here was the greatest medical school in the world, a school which pioneered the idea of teaching both at the bedside and in the dissecting room. Students came from all over the world to study under doctors who rightly believed that where they led, the rest of the world followed. In the next case, uh, cholera, the body heat is much greater. By cooling uh, the patient, we hope to counteract the progress of the fever. So ice is put to melt in the mouth in order to lower the temperature of the internal organs. At the same time, by wrapping the limbs in wet blankets, the exterior of the body can be similarly cooled. The treatment of disease as a collection of symptoms, as expounded by Professor von Hildenbrandt, was based on principles that hadn't changed much since the ancient Greeks. Not surprisingly, half the patients died. In the operating theatres, as many as nine out of ten would die, sometimes from shock, since there were no anaesthetics, more often from septicemia, since no one knew anything about infection. But changes were coming. Although to most surgeons a blood-stained coat was no more significant than a grease-stained overall is to a mechanic, and although they saw no connection at all between the blood poisoning that killed their patients and the fact that instruments were only cursorily washed, if at all, some radical new thinking was taking place. Since 1840, the professor of pathology had been Karl von Rokitansky. In the course of his career, he'd dissected over 30,000 corpses, examining and reporting on every diseased organ he found. It was he who paved the way for the notable advance that was about to be made at this hospital. Further ulcerations. Lower third of the small intestine. Elliptical. Perforated bowel. <laughs> Does peritonitis always follow from typhoid, Herr Professor? His dissections took him beyond the external symptoms to investigate what actually happened in the body during disease. It was a basic but fundamentally new approach and its implications were carried into the wards by one of his disciples, Medicine. Professor Skirda. Air, temperance and water are the best pills. Medicine is immaterial. It can surely do some good, sir. Only if applied to halting the anatomical changes the disease is bringing about in the body. I see, sir. You are from England? Yes, Herr Professor. Ralph. Ah, Mr. Ralph. Yes. Skoda was head of the department for chest diseases. By using such techniques as the stethoscope, an invention of 20 years earlier, he taught students to concentrate on what was happening in the lung, rather than concern themselves with how the patient felt. This patient has pleurisy, shortness of breath, dry cough, pains in the chest, lethargy. 
Professor von Hildebrand has doubtless told you how to try to treat these symptoms, but a collection of symptoms does not constitute a disease. They are merely the effects of it. We have got to get to the disease itself. By such precise techniques as tapping on a patient's chest to register the whole range of different sounds heard from the lung, he may not have done much for his patient, but to Skoda and Rokitansky, treatment was irrelevant. First, define the sound. Full to hollow, dull to clear, heavy to light. Full. And heavy. And here. What mattered to them? was understanding the process of disease. Only then could medicine advance. It was a view shared by Skoda's protege, Ferdinand von Hevra, head of the skin disease clinic, who set his patients on a plinth to be examined in public, however private their complaint. Well, turn around, man, so the students can have a good look at you. They've got to learn somehow. <laughs> what do you think you're here for, eh, to get well? <laughs> now, that's sore on his upper lip. It's not eczema, is it? <laughs> Married? Yes, sir. Good woman? Yes, sir. Ah, it must be you. Me, sir? Pick him up at the back of the Yosef Start to you. It's more exciting than anything you get from your wife, right? No, me, sir. I'm... Oh, come on. If you've not been sleeping with the whores at the back of the Yosef Start, who have you been sleeping with, eh? <laughs> You've got syphilis, man. If you didn't get it from your wife, who did you get it from? Well, I... Oh, never mind. In the primary stage at the moment. Right, let's get your britches down and see if you've got it on the other region, too. Oh, never mind about them. They'd like a good look. Could serve as a timely lesson to them, too. <laughs> and you. Come on, then, hurry up. But Hebra, Skoda and Rokitansky lacked the opportunity in their departments to show where their new approach to medicine could lead. This opportunity presented itself in the maternity, or lying-in wards. Among the women here, the dread was not of birth itself, but of childbed fever, or puerperal fever, that followed it. Its progress was always the same. A woman would have successfully given birth, would even be nursing her child, when inflammation would spread over the whole abdomen. To reduce this, leeches would be applied. A little later, a high fever would develop, and with the mother often still protesting her good health, the bowls and red towels would be brought out for bloodletting. Finally, there was the last resort, to the leather belts for restraining the delirious. But one young doctor, Ignat Semmelweis, a Hungarian, was appalled by what he saw. Vienna had the worst rate of this childbed fever in Europe. In some outbreaks, one mother in three died, their newborn babies often dying with them. It was in Rokitansky's analytical approach that Semmelweis saw some hope of understanding the disease. And so at five o'clock every morning, he'd come to the morgue to dissect the bodies of his former patients. At this time, Semmelweis, the son of a Budapest shopkeeper, was 28 years old. In spite of the suspicion with which Hungarians were regarded in Vienna, he had obtained the post of first assistant in the lying-in hospital. So far, his dissections had revealed a great deal about the processes of puerperal fever, but had brought him no nearer to discovering its cause. There were two divisions to the lying-in hospital. 
The first run by Semmelweis and his chief, Professor Klein. The second by midwives only. Dr. Semmelweis? <laughs> yes, Herr Director. Do we have a bed? In the midwives' division, there was nothing like so much puerperal fever as was found in Professor Klein's. In one year, five times as many women died from it in Klein's division as in the other. Semmelweis knew this well. So did the women who came here to have their babies. Some trouble, Doctor. She doesn't want to be admitted to our division, sir. She's lucky to be in hospital at all. Now, Dr. Semmelweis, any new fever cases this morning? Three in here, sir. Two in the next ward and one in each of the others. The miasma is peculiarly active at the moment. Pure poor or childbed fever is dependent on two factors. Externally, the miasma, which hangs in the air, overlying in hospitals like ours. Or internally, the failure of the uterus to give a proper local or milky discharge. Always very low in pure poor fever cases. Or more likely, an accumulation of milk in the body instead of being discharged through the breast or the uterus thus leading to milk peritonitis. Any questions? Yes, Herr Professor. That doesn't yes. explain this patient, sir. I beg your pardon, Doctor. This woman, sir. She was not pregnant. And she has the fever? Started last night. Is not this the patient with the tumour? Which I removed from the neck of the womb yesterday without difficulty. Tumour-proof fever? We had a similar case when I was a student. She died in a few days. She was not pregnant either. <laughs> it's not the only disease we can't explain. But why so much stronger in my division than in the other? 15% last month against only 4% in the midwife's clinic. And there's no difference between the two divisions? No. Well, except that we have students. Well, perhaps the women are more gentle. How do you mean? were gentler than the students when they examined. I mean, perhaps the midwives... Oh, would... no, Ferdinand. If the passage of a baby causes no injury, it's hardly likely that inserting a finger into the vaginal tract, however clumsy, could cause death. But the students do examine more often, don't they? Oh, no more than the student midwives. Oh. Seeing a midwife thinks shame could explain it. Shame? Women in childbirth being examined by men. <laughs> However much modesty is outraged by that, I cannot believe that it would lead to such a breakdown in health that disease can flourish. <laughs> Neither can I. <laughs> There's clearly something to do with the first division. The death rate has been four times higher with us for the last six years. How do you know that? I've been collecting the figures. Yeah. Skoda's example. Ah. What's Klein got to say? That the miasma in the air is particularly active. <laughs> the wife should be four times more active in one part of the hospital than the other. I can't imagine. Sad. Sounds like a woman in labor. Another street birth. woman to the hospital. Uh, 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 drive around the square till it's as good as born. The hospital less than 50 yards away. Arrive in time for the child to be admitted to the Foundling Hospital, but not in time for anyone to examine you in labor. Even if she can't hang on till after midnight, the longer she delays, the less time she'll spend with my doctors and students. That's what she's thinking. Well, I must get home. I promised Johanna I'd be early. <laughs> she pregnant yet? I hope not. But when she is, they're counting on you to deliver the child. Well, of course. But at my home. From the start, Semmelweis began to compare the differences between the two divisions.
Even on me, the priest's bell had a strange effect when it passed my door. Yet I could not see how fear, a state of mind, could bring about such anatomical changes as those to be seen in pure pearl fever. But I did know that in the midwives' division, the priests did not have to pass through their wards to reach the dying. So the women don't see it. Or have that bell to put the fear of death into their hearts before they even have their babies. And you think that's why they don't get the fever so much? I very much doubt it. But from now on, I want everything conducted in our division exactly as it is with the midwives. The priest has agreed to take a roundabout route to reach the furthest of our wards round there, unattended, so there will be no bell. And henceforth, I want all of our women delivered in the lateral, not the dorsal position. On this side? Why? Because that is invariably how it is done in the midwives' division. I had thought our greater mortality was due to something endemic to the first division itself. But if so, women who started their babies in the streets but were later delivered in our wards, whether they liked it or not, would also get pleural fever. They hardly ever did. Don't you touch me. And look, I didn't. I squashed up in a cab last night to have a whole lot of doctors going over me now. I shouldn't be in this ward anyway. Why? It was gone midnight when I got here. Why aren't I in with the midwives? Monday, isn't it? They were full up. Yeah. yeah it's only in here they're empty beds. And they've carried the corpses away. You don't need to worry about it. You won't become one. So if the cause is something to do with the first division, it must be something that happens before delivery. Must be. Well, having the windows kept closed for the next few weeks. Why? In the midwives' division, the windows open onto a passage. It's only in our division they open directly onto the outside air. So if there is anything in this peculiarly active miasma that Klein believes in... It's a crisis of the blood, as in so many diseases. Purple fever is unique. Is it? It's always assumed to be. Well, how can it be unique? when the pathological findings at post-mortems are so similar to those we find in other forms of blood disturbance. No, I meant the cause of the blood disturbance, not the results of it. Yes, but if the results are so similar to those we find in other diseases, perhaps it's in those other diseases that you should be looking for the cause. Soup again? I can't go another day with only soup. That's all they get on the second day in the other division. And Dr. Semmelweis insists the diet's to be the same. Well, what do I have tomorrow? Soup with bread and jam. Cheer up. On the seventh day, it's roast veal. She was delivered on her back against my firm instructions. If I may say so, Dr. Semmelweis. None of your instructions have made any difference to the fever cases yet. Perhaps because they're not being obeyed. Is there anything else, Doctor? Yes. On every woman's bed, I want to see not only her ward number, but also the number of the bed she occupied in the delivery room. And if fever develops, I want the time it started as well. Yes, Doctor. You see, I'm beginning to notice that the fevers develop in exactly the same order as the women are examined in labor. I've never doubted it's the students' fault, myself. Some of these foreign ones we have. Well, if it is, then we must prove it. We can only do that by eliminating all the other factors first. Purple fever has been with us for as long as I can remember. Oh, yes, Herr Director, but with respect, it was never like this in Professor Boer's time. Indeed. I have the figures here. When Boer was Professor of Obstetrics, it was only 1% of our women who ever died of purple fever. Are you suggesting that this disease in some way emanates from me? I'm only trying to connect the facts. It's almost as extraordinary as suggesting the priest has something to do with it. The priest has nothing to do with it. Since I've stopped him going through our ward with his bell, there has been no reduction in the fever rate at all. And since the midwives have been told to have the patients deliver on their sides? No reduction either. You admit it. So we are gradually eliminating the factors that could be responsible until in the end I have no doubt we shall isolate the one that is. And how much of your time will this take, Doctor? 
I don't know. But you do know, Dr. Semmelweis, that though the post of assistant is held for only two years, the occupant has the right to apply for an extension for another two years. I've only held the post for four months, sir. Whether I apply for an extension or not... I am I'm... talking about your predecessor, Dr. Bright. He has submitted an application to continue until July 1848. But I was appointed. I was told quite definitely that the post was mine. The post will be yours again then. There's nothing in Bright's contract to entitle him to continue for another two years. And nothing in his contract either to say that this application should be accepted. I shall expect you to give him all possible cooperation and loyalty, Dr. Semmelweis. A summary dismissal. A confirmation for Semmelweis of just how precarious his position as a Hungarian was. But Bright soon left and Semmelweis was reinstated. Meanwhile, news of the puerperal fever mortalities had reached the emperor, and a government commission was appointed to investigate. Klein, determined to maintain his entrenched position in the medical politics of Vienna, did not let them meet the one man who could have thrown some light on their inquiries. Instead, he hinted it was probably the foreign students who were responsible. Klein never trusted foreigners. So the foreign students were banned from the wards, and oddly enough, the fever rate did go down. As soon as I was reinstated as assistant, I took a short holiday in Venice with a couple of friends before taking up my duties again. On my return, I was shocked to hear that Professor Kolechka had died, the man I held in the highest esteem. How? Oh. Scalpel wound while dissecting. And ask Rokitansky, he did the autopsy. Little more than a pinprick. They didn't even notice it. I'm surprised Kolechka could be so clumsy. It wasn't his scalpel. It was a student who was working in the same corpse. Be careful. Could happen to you. To any of us. It takes only the tiniest puncture for some minute particle of putrid organic matter from the cadaver to enter the bloodstream and... Swollen finger, pain in the arm, fever. Yeah, read my protocol. Pine, yeah? Yes, and pleuritis. Keratinitis. Abscess in the left eye. Come in. Phlebitis. Meningitis. Yeah. Classic case of cadaveric infection. And exactly the same pathological findings as in purple fever. Yes, because that's a disorder of the blood as well. But no one uses a scalpel in the lying in hospital. They're not surgical cases. Uh, that's a superficial point. The nature of the wound doesn't matter. But why cadaveric materia should upset the balance of the blood? Now, break. Cut to expose the infected area. But how could cadaveric material enter the bloodstream of a pregnant? It rushed into my mind with irresistible clarity that if the disease from which Kolechka died was the same as that which proved fatal to so many women after childbirth, then the cause could be identical. Did the women I see dying have cadaveric material carried into their circulation too? It's very putrid, sir. That's not unusual, Greg. Carry on. To that question, I could only answer yes. Every morning, ironically, in the best tradition of the Vienna School, the students attended Professor Klein in the labor ward, examining women in childbirth. And they'd come there direct from the dissecting room. But they washed their hands. Obviously not well enough. If a particle of cadaveric matter so small, it could enter a pinprick in poor Kolechka and kill him, well, Think what could happen in the wound left by the separation of the placenta alone. 
No wonder they have less purpural fever in the midwives' division. They don't dissect in the dead house. And it explains why women with prolonged labor may be examined by students two or three times, invariably get the disease, while those with short labor generally don't. And also, why they go down in rows. In the same order, they were examined in the labor ward. But it doesn't explain why, why women who are not even pregnant can get it. Students don't examine them in labor. But they still examine them. And even if they don't, I do. Which is probably why the fever rate decreased when Dr. Bright temporarily deprived me of my post. I understood it also decreased when foreign students were barred from the ward. Well, of course, because they tend to be more conscientious than the others and examine more often. Dr. Bright examined women, too. Dr. Bright was not so anxious to discover the cause of this disease that he got up early every morning to dissect. His patients lived because he never went near the dead house. I had occupied myself with the cadaver to an extent reached by few obstetricians. God alone knows the number of women I assigned prematurely to their graves. Semmelweis had now to find a washing agent that would rid the hands of any particles of putrid matter from the corpses. Sifting through the scant knowledge then available, he found an answer. All students and doctors, at least he includes himself, <laughs> all students and doctors who enter the wards to make an examination must wash their hands thoroughly in the solution of chloride of lime, which is placed in convenient basins near the entrance to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and do it thoroughly till there is no smell of the dissecting room on your hands at all. That's a pretty foul smell from this, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Not one that kills. Do we carry the bowl with us from one patient to the next? Uh, as long as all traces of the dead house have been removed first, soap and water will be sufficient between examinations. Within a month, the mortality rate fell from 12% to 3%. By July and August, it was down to under 2%. Figures that haven't been bettered for 25 years. When Bohr was director, you are implying. So it would seem. Why should that particular professor of aesthetics be so enlightened? He didn't have the advantage of Dr. Semmelweis's advice. No, but Bohr used to teach on the phantom until the you in phantom. What did any student learn from a wooden model of a pregnant female? with a cupboard for a womb and a doll inside for a fetus. Until you insisted that students should learn instead on the cadavers of women who died in childbirth. It was official policy and imperial decree. Nevertheless, the pure pure fever rate shot up to 7% in the first year. Shkoda, you are professor of chest diseases here. I am professor of obstetrics. Good morning. Good morning, sir. So, Herr Director is not impressed. All the symptoms of small-minded bureaucracy. Semmelweis must publish. <laughs> I shall be emperor of... Uh, Please be serious, Hebra. I am. I am. Ignatz will never overcome his childhood phobia. I cannot write. How often have we heard that? <laughs> and worse, he suffers from the naive belief that the truth will be self-evident. Then as editor of the journal, you must publish for him. I intend to. <laughs> Sir, we had a meeting, all the foreign students. If we each write to a professor or obstetrician in our own countries, well, between us we can cover the whole of Europe. I shall write to London. Yes, yes. Well, do we have your approval, sir? Of course, if you think it's necessary. Thank you, sir. Thank you again, Greg. Not a single case in the whole ward. Come, we'll go straight to the delivery room. But it wasn't long before the fever returned. So this evil-smelling chloride that permeates the entire hospital is not the magic cure. 
The figures are up again today, Herr Director. Five percent have fever. Well, how does my assistant explain that? One of you. At least. Has been willfully defying my instructions. Show me your hand. I can smell it from here. Stent of the dead house. When her man arrives, you will tell him she died because you would rather have the smell of death on your fingers than the odor of chlorine. You're doing. Bleed her, then send for the priest. Tell her man why she died. Five percent again this month. Because one brainless, callous, irresponsible student thinks he knows better than I do. I give to you a murderer. Aware of the importance of Semmelweis's discovery, Hebra wrote about it for a leading medical journal. Semmelweis himself said nothing. The facts, he thought, spoke for themselves. Yes? Ward 3, Doctor. Examine them all in labour yesterday, in turn, beginning with this one. And we all washed thoroughly, as you know, sir. But this woman is unaffected. And we examined her more closely than any of them. She has that medullary cancer, you remember. Nine women in labor. The first has a foul-smelling cancer of the uterus, so I get the students to examine her most carefully. We move on to the others, one by one, examine them all in turn. Tonight, every one of them has trial bed fever, except the first, the woman with the cancer. So? It's not just cadaveric particles. It's any putrescent matter. We infected the others with what we took from the first. Are you sure about that? No, not yet. But I'm going to insist that the washings take place between every examination. Frau Muller? What is going on in this hospital? My authority is being openly defied. I'm sorry, Herr Director, but Dr. Semmelweis... And who is that woman? She has a badly discharged and carious knee joint. Dr. Semmelweis is having her transfer to the general hospital. Why? The patient next to her has developed child bed fever. So? Your innumerable and time-consuming hand-washings are a failure. No, Herr Director. This is something new. That woman's knee was not touched by any of us. It can only mean that putrid material can also be carried through the air. On wings. Metalik must go! Metalik must go! In 1848, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was tottering under a revolution that was spreading across Europe. Revolution in air, listen to them. Metternich must go! Metternich must go! Metternich must go! Metternich must go. Metternich must go. Metternich must go. Metternich must go. Spies everywhere! Whose side are you on? Say, join the Legion! You're Hungarian, aren't you? Your countrymen are rebelling against the Habsburgs. Stand up for Kossuths. Metternich will go in a couple of months, and so will Klein, and so will all the rest of the old guard. Metternich must go! Metternich must go! Klein must go! Klein must go! Klein must go! Johann Klein must go! Johann Klein must go! Johann Klein must go! Freedom! No, no, I don't mean from Metternich, not yet. I mean here, for a whole month, 
Thanks to the simplest of precautions, there has not been a single case of purple fever in this division. The first time for a quarter of a century. Doctor Shallowbite? Yes. Herr Director. Now, I do pray to political affiliations in this hospital. Go and change that uniform at once. With respect, Herr Director. The Academic Legion is still a legal organization in Vienna, and since I'm not on duty, I have every right to wear it. Not in my wards, Doctor. You have five minutes, Miss, to change. Or leave! Dr. Semmelweis! Ah. A message from Professor Hebra. He wants you at his house. Frau Hebra's pains have started. Then get a bag of chlorinated lime. Yes, Doctor. Well, boy, perfectly delivered. No, so, wash up, up to your elbows. For a while, it seemed that Semmelweis's discovery would be acclaimed. The letters his students had sent off began to bear fruit. From London, Dr. Rouse wrote, In the Assembly of English Physicians, which took place last week, I delivered a lecture in which I announced your discovery. My address was well received, and many of the most learned members declare the arguments convincing. Excellent. Tilanus of Amsterdam, Michaelis of Kiel, everywhere your doctrine is being recognized. Except in Vienna. Van Arnett has heard from Simpson of Edinburgh. Simpson believes there's nothing more than the English theory of contagion. Then he's wrong. And in too many places, they keep on saying they have pure poor fever, despite the fact that their students don't do any dissecting at all. Well, and how do you answer that? Because it isn't only particles from the dead house that cause it. It's any putrescent organic matter. Surely you don't misunderstand me as well. Hmm? No, no, of course not. Everywhere I am misinterpreted. My dear Semmelweis, the Board of Studies is meeting tomorrow and I intend to ask them for a commission to construct a statistical table correlating pure profibo mortality with the extent to which students and assistants occupy themselves with this section. You'll get nowhere as long as Klein is Professor of Obstetrics. Klein? A majority vote from the Board of Studies can overrule Klein. And the motion was carried. Everyone voted in favor, with the exception of Rose S. Ryman and myself. So, the real commission, then? Thou no, will not. This resolution is tantamount to saying I don't know how to run my own department. It's a slander, sir, as Ryman said to the meeting. It's up to me to decide if Semmelweis's theory deserves further investigation. I shall protest to the Ministry of Education. The faculty resolution will be quashed. I believe that Dr. Haller is quite impressed with young Semmelweis's uh, discovery. Then Haller's either a fool or he's so scared the revolution will succeed he wants to keep in with the insurgents. For that's what Semmelweis is, make no mistake on that. A Hungarian rebel. There is Skoda on his side, another foreigner. Everything that matters is under fire. Society, the empire, even medicine. We have to stand firm. It's our patriotic duty. Oh, revolution had failed. The old guard were more firmly entrenched than ever. Klein refused to renew Semmelweis's contract and appointed a Dr. Brown in his place. Semmelweis applied for a teaching post and waited in vain for a reply. And still he refused to speak about his work himself. Then lend me all your notes and let me address the Academy of Sciences for you. They're already prepared to provide you with funds. I don't need funds. I only need access to hospital records. And Klein has now barred me from those. But it can't all be proved by statistics. Experiments on animals. That's what's needed now. What do we learn from animals we don't know already? Accept the Academy of uh, You need money to live on anyway. Experiment on animals. So Semmelweis half-heartedly did a series of experiments on animals and Skoda addressed the Academy of Sciences. 
But not only did Škoda fail to mention that it wasn't just particles from dead bodies that caused the disease, he also launched a bitter attack on his old colleagues at the University of Prague. Who tell me they have undertaken these preventative measures with no appreciable result. All I can say to that is that they must have conducted these chlorine washings with reprehensible carelessness. Prague was outraged. Unwittingly, Škoda had made enemies for Semmelweis in another European capital. Elsewhere, his theory had now also been dismissed, largely because they'd nothing else to go on but Škoda's narrow interpretation of it. Semmelweis had pointed the way at last to a true understanding of disease, but so many things had conspired to obscure the real value of his results. Above all, his own obstinate adherence to the idea that the truth will out. In October 1850, disheartened, bitter, short of money, Semmelweis, without even saying goodbye to his friends, left Vienna. He returned to Budapest, his native city, where he ran into Markasovsky again, former student at Vienna, now a prosperous GP. Semmelweis soon realized that even in his own city, his doctrine was misunderstood. Well, yes, but our students at the university clinic, they dissect. But don't attend women in childbirth at the hospital, and yet there's plenty of puerperal fever there. It's not just dead bodies, Ludwig. Well, I was led to believe. Show me this hospital, and I will explain it. It didn't take him long. The chief obstetrician was also the hospital surgeon. Thanks to Markasovsky's influence, Semmelweis was now made professor of obstetrics at the university. He at once introduced into the clinic all his disinfectant techniques and soon reduced the incidence of puerperal fever. Then suddenly there was another outbreak and the administrators who to start with had opposed him as much as Klein ever did were triumphant. Give the laundry contract to the man who is the cheapest. Of course he's cheap. Most of it comes back in the same foul condition it went out in. Smell it, your clean linen. That's the cause of our latest outbreak. It wasn't long before his disinfectant techniques, which he now applied to all instruments used, made his clinic perhaps the healthiest and safest in all Europe. But still no one knew about it. And while in other countries, other men were beginning to get to grips with the nature of infection, Semmelweis put all this aside content with what he'd achieved in his native city. At 38, relaxing a little at last, he took up swimming and horse riding. He met a girl of 18 called Mary Weidenhofer. Gentle, mature and understanding, she married him and within a year she was pregnant. When the baby was born, Ignaz took every care to avoid the risk of puerperal fever. But within 48 hours, the baby died from hydrocephalus, water on the brain. Depressed by the child's death and aware that it was now 12 years since he'd made his discovery in Vienna, he decided at last to publish The Etiology, Concept and Prophylaxis of Puerperal Fever. But he was 12 years too late. A rambling, repetitive account of his achievements in Vienna, followed by an attack on all who disagreed with his views, the book met with almost no response. So Semmelweis took up his cause once more, this time by writing open letters to his opponents. I carry with me the conviction that since that year, thousands of women and babies have died who need not have died in this massacre. You, Herr Professor, have participated. Your teaching is based on the dead bodies of lying in women, slaughtered through ignorance. And I have formed the unshakable resolution to put an end to this murderous work so far as lies within my power to do so. This homicide must cease! 
I shall keep watch on every man who dares spread dangerous error. If you continue, Herr Hofrath, to teach your students that purple fever is epidemic, I denounce you before God and the world as a murderer. Oh, if only Samuelweiss had been in London with me, Franz. He'd have realized then his fanatical raving against his enemies just makes him a laughing stock. I saw gynecological operations performed there that Ignaz could learn to do here, with far less danger. But even now, with his prophylactic methods, he's a far better record than they have. <laughs> but you tell them that in London, and they just laugh. Well, if they've heard of him at all, they think he's a lunatic. I sometimes wonder whether he may not be. Oh, Maria, I only... Yeah, they so wildly. Dr. Herschel tells me that the other day he suddenly leapt to his feet at a faculty meeting and recited the oath made by midwives on qualifying. It had no bearing on anything they were discussing. Oh, get him back to work. That's the best therapy for him. Gynecological surgery. He could solve the whole problem of wound infection if he set his mind to it. And while in London, I heard of a professor in Glasgow who was already teaching his students that the amount of separation from a wound follows directly the amount of decomposing matter that gets into it. And what this does exactly, I... Oh, I'm sorry, Marie. It's just that medicine is moving ahead of Ignatz, and I so want him to catch up. It's already been demonstrated that disease can be caused by invisible organisms carried in the air. Now, Ignatz would say he proved that himself 18 years ago. That woman in Vienna with a carious knee joint. The question now is, what are these, these organisms, these germs? How do they work? How can they be identified? Ah, Ignaz. <laughs> How are you, Ignaz? Eh? Yes, Ludwig, I wanted to see you. Well, I should hope so, too, after a year away in London. This article you wrote in Orvot C. Hedelop. But that was years ago, after your book was published. Something yet to be discovered? You, too. You, too, find my doctrine not yet fully established. Ignatz, be reasonable. Ignatz, you're not yourself. Man, I thought my friend. That was a clearer explanation of your doctrine than anything you ever wrote. Just because I said the next stage must be to identify... Next stage? The facts, the figures, the statistics prove everything that matter. Cleanse the hands. Cleanse the instruments by a single Kreutzer's worth of chlorinated lime. Yes, but what are we fighting? That's what we must ask now. What is it in decomposing animal matter that causes the physiological changes seen in disease? i just come back from London, Ignatz, and I was telling Marie about this uh, surgeon in Scotland who's thinking on just the same lines as you have been. Leave my house. Ignatz. I said, leave my house. Get out. Ignatz. Well, I don't have my enemies inside my own house. There are enough to fight as it is. I'm surrounded. Scatsy, proud. Scansoni, you, traitors, murderers. In July 1865, Semmelweis returned to Vienna. His old friend, von Hebra, met him at the railway station. They had told Semmelweis they were to stay as guests of the Hebras, but this was not the true purpose of the journey. From the 1st of January, 1849, to the last day of December, 1858, precisely 1,924 women died in your lying-in hospital who would have lived if anybody had listened to me. 
You didn't know that. In the last few months, Semmelweis had employed his antiseptic methods in plenty of gynecological operations. But Markosowski's hopes that he would make a new name for himself in obstetrical surgery had faded. Semmelweis's behavior had become so outrageous, it was obvious to everyone his mind was unhinged. There was only one course of action. He must be committed for treatment. If professors of obstetrics do not soon comply with my doctrine, I will address myself to the helpless public. You, father of a family, do you know what it is to summon a doctor to your wife? It is to expose her and your unborn child to the danger of death. When I, with my present convictions, look back upon the past, I can only dispel the sadness which falls on me by gazing into that happy future when, within the lying-in hospitals and also outside them, only cases of self-infection will occur. The conviction that such a time must inevitably arise will cheer my dying hour. I was there then. Is this where you live now, then? In the country? No, no, it's just another hospital. I think you'd be interested to see it. Would you like to? Do we have time? Oh, yes, there's plenty of time. Dr. Rydell, an old friend of mine, he'd be most interested to meet you. Go around. I'd like to. But there's Mari and the no, child. Oh, Mari won't mind waiting. You'll wait, won't you, Mari? Come along. Ten days later, in the Royal Infirmary, Glasgow, Dr. McPhee, an assistant surgeon to Professor Joseph Lister, laid a piece of lint dipped in liquid carbolic acid on a deep wound in the fractured leg of a child. It was the first specific attempt to prevent the blood poisoning that normally followed such operations. Although similar to the antiseptic solution that Semmelweis had employed 18 years earlier, Lister had based his method not on any knowledge of Semmelweis's work, but on the strict scientific researches of the French chemist, Louis Pasteur. The day after that operation, Semmelweis died in the mental home they'd only just taken him to. His body was carried to the General Hospital at Vienna for a post-mortem in the same pathology department where he had himself conducted so many autopsies. Rokitansky was to learn that his friend had died from blood poisoning. It seemed to have spread from a small wound on the middle finger of his right hand an accident almost identical to the one that had led to his discovery 18 years earlier. Four days later, in Glasgow, Joseph Lister removed the lint from his patient's leg and found no pus or any signs of blood poisoning. The principle of antisepsis was being proved scientifically, and it was just this scientific proof, which men like Pasteur could provide, and Semmelweis had never seen the point of, that the world now needed if man was to get the better of disease. <laughs>